Good morning, good morning. Sean here with Accelerators Organization, ready for another mentor session. Remember, you can always ask questions in the portal. You're gonna receive an answer from Honey, my assistant, with a link to me answering your question. Keep the questions coming. We're adding more and more mentors here soon and really need more questions from you guys so we can help you out, all right? Here we go. First question comes from Tiffany, and Tiffany says, how do I develop centers of influence in my business? The background is I'm a new real estate agent and I've heard developing centers of influence will build your business by having the right kind of people to surround yourself with. Well, my first inclination goes to think about where do people go and who do they ask potentially when it comes to buying a home or selling a home? My immediate thought goes to I might ask my attorney, I might ask my real estate or my, um, my, um, my insurance agent, I might ask my accountant. Um, I'm gonna ask friends, of course, so the more we get out there and just network and become a good person, you know, the better. Um, I would also think about, where else would people go to? Gosh, barbers, your hairstylists, dentists, you know, anything and everything you can do to develop centers of influence where people might ask people for advice because they um, respect their opinion, that's where I would go. I've got a couple more people answering this for you that might have more experience, especially Tom Black, um, who has coached uh, real estate people, but I've got about seven or eight different mentors answering this for you, Tiffany, okay? Hey, Kim. Uh, go out to the garage, please. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Janelle. And Janelle says, how does the name of my business sound before I move forward in purchasing the web address? And is there another option to purchase other than GoDaddy broker service fee? I'm not sure if I understand that question. The background is I help people through all stages of a relationship through coaching, counseling, and matchmaking. Since this is a new business idea, I have been working on what to name my business. When I looked up the domain name to see if it was available on GoDaddy, it says that the site's already taken. And when I went to the site, it doesn't look like the owner's using it. So I sent them an email, but it bounced back. Before I purchase the domain, I want to know how does the name of my business sound before I move forward in purchasing the web address? And is there another option to purchase other than the GoDaddy brokerage service fee? Not sure if I understand the part about how does the name of my business sound before I move forward. I don't understand that question. Might have to resubmit a question. But you and I talked about this. I use GoDaddy because I have a GoDaddy account and that's where all my domains are. So that's traditionally where I purchase the domain. I've never purchased a domain from somebody who owns it, but I would and generally speaking, you do have to go through an agency or broker like GoDaddy wherever that site has been purchased. So if GoDaddy has it listed for sale, that might be the place to go. It's not uncommon that people will park domains, meaning they purchase domains thinking that somebody might want it in the future, like an asset. And then people will say, I want to buy it for this amount. And so it's not uncommon. And sometimes it's negotiable. You might be able to put an offer down or what have you, but traditionally speaking, it's really hard to get a hold of those people to negotiate directly. They just let it happen right through GoDaddy and GoDaddy takes a fee. All right, the next question comes from Steven. And Steven says, at what point do I give up on a highly profitable sale? The background is I have a customer I have done signs for before and at the point of doing those signs inquired about other signs on the property. Since then I have given the proofs and prices and have not heard anything back. During the winter months he is less prone to be in the office and be with his family. But I've sent multiple emails and left messages with his secretary. When do I give up on the sale and stop trying to contact him? Okay so Stephen I've got about six other mentors answering this for you. This is just say good old fashioned professional salesmanship. I think the point I would reframe here is that you're not giving up on the sale. What you're, it sounds like what you're asking is you're giving up on the customer and I would never give up on a customer. 
I've had times where I've tried to get a hold of people for months and months and they never return my phone call. I'll never be unprofessional. I'll never give them shit for not returning my phone calls or emails. And then out of the blue, they'll just call me and go, hey, Sean, I need to go ahead and uh, order this. Then I will say, hey, I gave you a quote six months ago on that. I need to revisit to see if any prices have changed because maybe there's a difference of cost of your of cost of goods sold or you know something that you're putting in your proposal. So say, fantastic, John. Let me get, pull up the quote again. Let me see if we need to make any modifications. Are there any modifications to the scope of work? Let's do it. But I would never give up on the relationship. Just It just means that that person, the bottom line is when someone doesn't return our phone calls to buy something that we've given them a quote on, the pain point of them needing to buy it right now is not there. And that's okay. Our job as a professional salesperson is to just continually prime the pump, send occasional emails here and there, maybe leave a voicemail, um, and just wait for the sale to come in or not come in. But it sounds like you have a relationship with this person, so just be professional and keep following up. And I wouldn't follow up every day for the first week or so. I might follow up every few days and then maybe once a week. And then at some point, maybe after a month, month and a half, I might just give up on that particular thing. And then I just might keep in touch with the person and say, hey, keep me in touch if you ever need any uh, signs done. I also find that this question is commonly asked among salespeople who aren't that busy prospecting. If you were so busy prospecting and doing quotes and bids for all kinds of other customers and getting lots of other orders, you'd worry less about this particular prospect, okay? Just make this, this is just one phone call, one follow-up phone call during the day that you need to make, but make sure you've got a steady flow of outbound sales calls that you're making to try to drum up new business and just go out there and get more and more business and then you're not going to worry about this guy not returning your phone call. Okay? Hope that helps, Stephen. The next question comes from Colin and Colin says, what are some good places to look for investment? VC lists, accelerators, what exactly should I prepare to show potential investors? Pitch deck, metrics, etc. The background is Paul, Paul Mates app is an app that connects dog owners near each other like tinder i've had some initial traction on new spots and 10,000 downloads in four months i'm working hard on branding thanks to a discussion with sean but need some guidance on funding and where to find it so you and i spoke about this colin the odds of getting any type of investment right now without a proven track record of success is going to be very very difficult because you're going to be looking for what's called angel investors or possibly even private equity, but without having a demonstrable team, team already developed, a go-to-market, real go-to-market strategy, a real idea of exactly what is in it for the investor, the odds of getting an investor is very unlikely. What I would recommend doing, especially as a software play, is I would be submitting applications to business incubators all throughout the United States and Canada, which I think you're in Canada, but I would be submitting applications to business incubators all across the United States and Canada, if you, if you can come to the United States. The reason why is business incubators, especially software business incubators, specifically know what is a good idea, what it would take to get it to minimum viable product, in order to put together the business model to go out and get funding. If you can convince a business incubator to let you get in their program, that is your first sign that you have an idea that they think people would be interested in investing in. If you can't convince a business incubator to let you go through their 90, 120 day, six month program, to get the, inve el the elevator pitch done, the, e the investment deck, everything that's needed, then that's gonna speak a lot about where you are in the phase of your business. Um, I believe that there's some information in the portal in the Resource Center under raising capital. Uh, in the Resource Center, there's some articles around raising capital. Go through those articles. If you need more information, let me know and I can get you some more information. 
You can also go down the rabbit hole on Google and just say, um, what types of business investors are there? How do you pitch an, uh, an investor? What is each type of investor looking for? What's an angel investor looking for? What's a private equity? Like I would go in and start doing massive research on understanding investment, but I am going to tell you right now from experience, my personal experience, if you're asking questions like this of how to look for them, you are not even remotely in the neighborhood of being ready to pitch an investor. So you have a lot of homework about just understanding investments. Here's some other terms you're gonna learn. You wanna learn about investment terms. So you're gonna need to learn about debt, um, debt, equity, warrants, um, options, um, vesting schedules, cap tables. You're gonna have to learn about all the different nuances of an operating agreement, class of shares, uh, all these things are things that you're going to have to be expert on if you're going to get into dealing with private equity in those types. When working with an angel investor, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship like you and I talking and negotiating, um, which is what I did. And I'll tell you this, because I didn't know what I was doing, I actually left millions of dollars on the table because I wasn't educated on knowing how to, how to negotiate and pitch my company correctly. Um, this is some really, really complex stuff, um, and it just requires you going and getting, doing your homework like you're doing right now, asking questions. Um, but there has to be a clear path to monetization and making profit. Remember, an investor is investing in something to make a profit. If I invest money in you, how soon can I expect it back? If I were in your shoes as well, I would literally go watch every episode. Just I would be doing a crash course on watching the Shark Tank and the, the Lion's Den. Those shows tell you exactly what investors are looking for, 100%. Every episode is questions from investors, what they're looking for, how the entrepreneurs answer, who answers bad, who answers good, who gets a deal, who doesn't. Best education you could ever do for yourself. I would, take, I would take notes on each episode of, I need to be able to answer this question, I need to be able to get this information, I'd be taking notes. Okay, the next question comes from Joshua, and Joshua says, am I being lazy? The background is, I get more work done working remotely at a Panera Bread or in the car than in my home office that's in my room. My room is small and the windows are small. I can't see nature. My office desk is in my room, but so is my bed. I seem to get more work done when I'm able to stare at nature when I'm in my car or when I'm at Panera Bread. Is there a way to set things up to be more productive? Well, hey, if you get less done working in your home and you get more done working in Panera, go work at Panera. Another option might be taking a look at co-working space. Co-working space is relatively inexpensive, maybe $500 a month. And you can sit in the lobby of a really nice place or they have even phone rooms where you can make phone calls. The bottom line that I wanna focus on, especially since I know that you're in lead generation and sales for yourself, is I wanna be focusing on how many calls do I need to be making each day. I wanna take a look at my CRM and analyze all the different follow-up phone calls of the different stages that all my prospects are in. And I wanna make sure that I'm being productive during those revenue generating hours. And if I'm not productive at home, then I'm gonna go wherever I need to go. Uh, a lot of people can't work at home and stay as efficient and productive, and that's fine. Go somewhere else, rent a co-working space, um, go to a coffee shop, just worry about noise, obviously, but co-working spaces, I find are the best spaces. If you just need to be out of the house and somewhere, it's less noisy, it's more conducive to small business owners like yourself, okay? Hope that helps. I get some more mentors answering that for you too, Joshua. Okay, the next question comes from Grant, and, or I'm um, no, the next question comes from Joshua Grant. And Joshua says, when do I need to stop outsourcing and buy the tools and machines to do it in-house? The background is I'm a welding and fabrication business that fabricates a lot of metal products or products are powder coated. This is a better way of painting that lasts a lot longer if done correctly. My problem is it's taking a lot longer to get my parts done, two weeks, and I feel it's hurting my cash flow. I project that we can finish in a week, then take the powder coat, wait two weeks, then install and deliver, then wait to get paid. 
the company that does this service is just getting larger. In the past, it would take them three to five days. The equipment cost is around $75,000 for turnkey. Last year, I spent $20,000 with them. How can I calculate the return on investment if I make the investment to bring in-house and what else should I take into consideration? All right, I've got about eight other mentors answering this one for you. This is I, I love this one, Joshua. When I ran my last company, this is something we looked at a lot. We, when we would outsource to different vendors to do certain things for us, we had to, we always were evaluating and determining would it be better for us to bring that in house? Some of the things that you've got to take into consideration is is not necessarily bringing it in house from an equipment perspective, but how much is it also going to cost you to get somebody to do the actual work? You'll need to take that into the equation. So I I, I know I have uh, Tyler McBroom, Dan Abate, and um, some others answering this question for you, but there is a way to calculate the ROI in a spreadsheet in an Excel spreadsheet. I don't know how to do that, but I would go to Dan Abate probably and I would pay him $500 or however much it would cost. And I would say, Dan, can you help me put together a spreadsheet to analyze what my payback would be if I bought this equipment? You'd also have to take into consideration, are you using cash or are you financing? So you might have additional debt interest fees if you're going to be financing it. And you would want to weigh that against the amount of money that you would be spending and how long would it take. If it might take you under three years to get all your money back from that investment and you could service the debt or the loan that you might take or you have the cash, whatever it might be, three years would be, in my guess, if it was going to take me three years based on just my current production, I would probably make the investment. But I also want to take a look at if I go ahead and uh, invest in this and I can get things done faster, can I do more than $20,000 worth of a business that I would do and would my payback be even faster? Those are some things I take into consideration. Okay, the next question comes from Quaid and Quaid says, should initial inquiries be personalized or scripted? The background, I'm currently looking to expand my network, both clients and suppliers, and I'm wondering if it is necessary to custom make each email for each recipient. I feel like a scripted approach will streamline the process. However, I don't want to come off as robotic. For example, there are five kitchen suppliers on my radar. would love to know the best way to curate those relationships. Well, I mean, in this example, if there were five kitchen suppliers on my radar, I'd pick up the phone or I'd go visit their place of business. I wouldn't send cold emails. I may send a cold email that says, hey, John, my name is Quaid. I run XYZ Construction Company. I wanted to get together with you and talk about... Uh, how we could do some business together. I'm going to be in your area on Tuesday and Thursday, and I'm going to drop by. I just want to send you an email. Here's my phone number. If there's a better time, just call me and we can set up an appointment. And I would just go by their office. And when I went by their office, if I didn't hear from them, I'd say, hey, uh, my name is Sean. I'm here to see John. Hey, John, I sent you an email on Monday letting you know I was going to be in the area Tuesday, Thursday. I'm not sure if you got the email, but I'm a construction person. I want to see about doing some business with you. I would, one, if it's that few of people you're trying to create relationships with, in person is always the best. Phone call the second. Emails are used to set up phone calls and meetings. Email isn't meant to conduct business. It's meant to get the appointment on the phone or in person. Um, if you were sending an email out to a thousand people, then maybe you might have some sort of form, you know, email template that you would use. But for anything under 10, 20 emails, I would just send personal emails. And there might be a little bit of it that might be standard as far as trying to make an appointment, but the rest of it I'm, I wanna make as personal as possible. People, people know usually if they're looking at a template or if it's a real email unless it's crafted very well. But if it's just a small amount, I would just go make phone calls. That's what I would do. Okay, the next question comes from Quaid, and Quaid says, when would you consider protecting IP, intellectual property? As I create more forms and systems to enhance my services, I've had the thought about copyright and trademarks. I feel as though all the forms I am making will set me apart from competition. I would love to be able to license out all these systems and processes when I hit that level. That way I can help others operate better companies while getting another stream of revenue. Not sure if this is common practice with small business. Figured it's worth an ask. Thanks. I've got a bunch of other mentors to answer this, and I'm interested to see what they might say. But as far as I'm concerned, I think it would be a complete waste of time. Um, everybody does what we call R&D. 
rip off and duplicate. I'll go find your form, change it up a little bit, make it mine. You're never even gonna know that I did it. And I'm certainly not gonna pay somebody for forms and processes that they've done. I, I, that's just not something I can do. I can go online right now and download an independent contract agreement, modify it, use it in a small business situation, not a big deal. Something else to take into consideration with this quid is also, um, if you wanna go through the process of copywriting all this type of stuff, go for it. Probably not gonna be trademarkable. Copyright, sure, but you've gotta register the trademark. The next thing is, what if somebody steals your form? Are you gonna sue them and spend the tens of thousands of dollars and the years that it could take to litigate someone using one of your forms? Probably not. I would focus on creating great systems and processes for your company, creating those forms, using them in your business, building up a big empire of your business. Then someday, if you think that other contractors or construction companies could use your systems and processes, you could evaluate it at that time. But right now with the stage of the early stage of your business, I think it would be a complete waste of time. I wouldn't do it myself. Um, but you could, if you wanted to go th down the, Take, take the necessary time it would take to go online and register your copyright for anything that you're specifically doing. Um, I don't know how to do that myself. I'm sure I could figure it out with a quick Google, Google search, but I, I just think it would be a waste of time. Okay, the next question comes from Mark. And Mark says, how do I transition to a different professional segment or business model that will create ongoing residual income? The background is I've been an S corporation in the automotive training sector since 2002. I feel stuck in an industry where this is all I feel qualified to do. That is train sales communications in sales and service in auto dealerships. I no longer have the passion and drive I once had. I find myself being one phone call from going out of business and two phone calls away from being overbooked. During the pandemic, I made investments in podcast equipment and have not generated $1 of revenue from going live on Facebook, feeling lost and left behind, turning 56 this month, frustrated. Who I've got about eight other mentors, and I picked some mentors that are a little bit on the older side, like you and I, uh, Mark, So because once we get older, we can kind of empathize with that a little bit. You know, creating and transitioning into a new business is just like starting a new business. I would look to see the skills that you have and how that could translate into a new business. Another thing I if and I don't know if we've talked yet I can't remember and I apologize for that, but I would be like, have you lost your passion of training salespeople? And if so, then yeah, you could probably just go get a job doing sales and make more money and not have to worry about the ebbs and flows and ups and downs of owning a business. I know that sales training has not gone away. Dealerships and companies in general always need sales training. I mean, in fact. <laughs> Dude, there's about a hundred different AO members that need sales training and sales processes and systems set up and to learn how to get more business. I mean, that's like one of the number one things that's needed out in the marketplace is people need help learning how to get more customers. Um, but I mean, if you're gonna try to transition into a whole new business, you, it, you know, it goes back to you know, the same thing in your business, business 101. What is, the, what is the problem or need in the marketplace? How are you gonna solve it? How much are you gonna charge? And then setting up your own sales and sales processes to get it done. Um, residual income, you know, residual income is created from, just like AO, creating a subscription revenue type business in which your clients are going to need your services on an ongoing basis. And instead of paying one large fee, maybe you spread it out over a monthly fee or whatever it might be. Um, if you are feeling that stuck, feel free to book a call with me and let's talk about it. But this is not something that easily can be solved by myself or somebody just answering a question like this because that, that requires a conversation. Okay, I feel for you. Look forward to talking to you. Reach out if you want, okay, man? Keep your head up. You're still young. 56 is still young. Okay, next question comes from Cody, and Cody says, how do I get above barely enough? It seems that when I was an employee, my paycheck was barely enough. Now that I'm a business owner, I'm making more money in the business than I ever 
I've ever seen, but still barely making it. Why is this? I got a bunch of other mentors answering this for you, Cody, and we'll talk about this on our onboarding call, but I can tell you why is this? It could be a combination of a lot of things. Are you not charging enough for your products and services? Are you, in an, in, are you selling a product or service that doesn't really have a great demand and great profitability? Is your overhead too high? Um, you know, so it could be a combination of a lot of things. We gotta dig in and find out why the products and services you're selling, is it not bringing in enough money to cover overhead? Are the margins too low? Is the timeliness of payment too slow? Um, are you not making enough sales calls and bringing in enough revenue? There's a, common, there's a lot of combinations that this could be, and we're really gonna have to dig in to figure this out. Um, this is why I have been sending out and I'm going to continue to send out a lot more information around it. the number one priority of our companies. Now that you know what product or, ser or service that you're offering, the number one priority has got to be on how do I go make more sales calls and bring in more business? And that's got to be the focus of figuring out that solution. The challenge is a lot of business owners have not been trained salespeople. And they need, we need to get sales training. If we're gonna own a business, we're our number one salesperson unless we have a salesperson. So we've gotta learn how to tr train ourselves to be good salespeople until we can find somebody that's going to, until we can afford to find somebody who can do it for us. But let's talk about this on the first call as well, okay? I'll tell you this too. It's not uncommon that as a business grows, their cash flow needs grow and it's, an, it's not uncommon that no matter what size you are, cash is always still an issue. There's a lot of businesses that go through that. And so we, could, we need to talk about that more, okay? Okay, the last question comes from Grant. And Grant says, what's the ideal CRM software for us to track a setter's leads who, who's done a call and who hasn't, whether they've converted or need to follow up, et cetera? Also, best financial qualification strategy. The background is of an online low back rehab coaching program. I'm hiring telemarketers and salespeople and want to track data and sales processes. Okay, I use Entreport. I've also used Salesforce. I've heard that there's a software called Pipe Drive, which is very common. This is not my expertise, but I'm, and I know there's another one called HubSpot as well. What I can tell you, Grant, is Whatever CRM software that you will actually use and get trained on and get your salespeople trained on how to use it the way that you want them to use it so that you can get the data that you want from the software, that's the best software. Salesforce is great, Entreport's great, Pipedrive I'm hearing is great, HubSpot is great. Whatever CRM software that you choose, there is going to be a certain amount of time that it's gonna take for you to learn how to use it and one of the things that I have found that really cut the learning curve is to go on Upwork, U-P-W-O-R-K, and search for and put a, create a job posting that you need a salesforce.com um, administrator consultant, and there's a ton of them. And you just start set, you put together your scope of work of what you want, You'd say you want someone to help you set up your system. You need to create a relationship with somebody that can be there on an ongoing basis to make tweaks as needed. That is the best thing that we can do as individual uh, entrepreneurs to get that kind of help without having to hire somebody to be a full-time employee doing it when we don't need a full-time employee, okay? So I got a couple of other mentors answering this that might already be using some CRM software outside of Entreport or Salesforce or HubSpot. I especially have Tom talking about this, but um, there's also a couple other people that I know have smaller companies and they're probably using a CRM. So they'll probably be able to tell you what one they use, okay? All right, that's today's mentor session. Hope you guys had a uh, great time. Uh, hello, hello to those of you that are watching and have popped in and just keep those questions coming. We have more and more mentors coming on board next month. So uh, get, get as many questions in as you can because the mentors are starving for your questions, all right? Talk to you soon. Peace out.